Yeah, I don't think Mother knew about this. Uncle Marvin was strangled by his own beard. Yeah, he never saw it coming. And welcome, America, to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. Great to have you along, Genies. We've got two great guests today. Of course, one you're very familiar with already. That's Krista Cowan from our sponsors over at Ancestry.com. They've got a movie coming out. Yeah, uh, it's actually already out, and it has to do with the last letters of Hawkins Wilson. He was an enslaved man who wrote to the Freedmen's Bureau about trying to find his family, but there was no success as a result of his letters until Ancestry found them and started to bring together his relatives. You're going to want to hear all about this, and you're going to want to see the movie. We'll tell you where you can find it. Then later in the show, Barbara Holloway Smith is on. We talked a little about her last week. She's the floral genealogist. She actually found flowers and plants and trees left on the estates of her ancestors, brought them home to her own garden, and she's got them going back to her second great-grandparents. It's an unbelievable story. You'll love to hear what she has to say. Hey, make sure you sign up today for our weekly genie newsletter. It is a growing concern, and it's absolutely free. You get a blog from me each week, plus links to past and present shows and links to stories stories you'll appreciate as a genealogist and family historian. Right now, it's time to head off to Boston, Massachusetts, where my good friend David Allen Lambert is standing by, the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. Hello, David. How you doing? I'm doing great. Making my list of things I want to do genealogically during the summer, but I thought I'd first start off with some great news stories that our listeners might enjoy. One of the things I always try to talk about is military, but I love it when I find something in the military I've never heard of before. (laughs) So on May 12th, 1896, a second lieutenant, James A. Moss, received permission to organize the 25th Infantry Bicycle Corps. Have you ever heard of that before? (laughs) No, that's crazy. It, It was the first of its kind, and actually there were eight enlisted black men in the U.S. Army who joined up and they would drill and do formations and they would pedal 40 miles a day and then to mark this 125 years ago they did a test ride 1900 miles 41 day expedition which started on the 14th of june 1897 and ended in st louis missouri I never knew this even existed. No, I've never heard of any of it. So you're talking about 125 years ago, this past week, this whole thing started. That's Mm -hmm. crazy. It is. Wow. I I always love new military facts. Here's one that you may have not known about, too, while we're talking military. The mullet, that really funky hairstyle back from the 80s. (laughs) Uh, Well, it was back in the 80 ADs as well. You can find traces of it in military history going back to the Trojan War. In fact, even Native American Nez Pierce tribe wore a hairstyle that is cropped similar. So as they say, business up front and a party in the back was <laughs> also in old Gaelic warriors in France, Celtic tribes in England. They all wore mullets. Your Viking ancestors did probably too. Maybe so. so. Did you have one, David? You might have been a little young for that. Uh, no, I burnt those photographs. Uh, no, actually, I never <laughs> did. I had curly hair. It would have looked rather ridiculous. Yeah. So yeah. I'm just glad to have a little hair now. Hey, I know that you love pocket watches, and we've talked about the pocket watches in our family archive, but, I mean, these things probably the smallest little heirloom shy of maybe a ring that you can get. And even if you bought one now and handed it down to your kids or your grandkids, you could start this tradition buying like a gold pocket watcher. Hey, maybe even just a nice Rolex. There's so much history to them. I wrote a nice article online that talked about someone passing down a watch that belonged to their great-great-grandparent born in the 1870s. It was exactly the same time frame. My great-grandfather, who was a railroad engineer, who I got the watch from indirectly from his step-nephew, who was in his 90s. Isn't that funny how that works sometimes? I mean, there's somebody who you probably didn't even know, and somehow it wound up in his hands and got it back over to you. It just works that way sometimes, doesn't it? 
the greatest thrill about that is one thing it's an artifact but if it works and you can wind it and hold it up to your ear and hear the same sound that your ancestor did, how cool is that? That's pretty fun, no doubt about it. And, and I love the one I have, and it's actually the replica of the one that my great-grandfather gave to his mistress in 1890. My cousin Jim has the original. It's got my great-grandfather's photo on the face of the watch <laughs> that he gave to his <laughs> mistress. And so I uh, went out and got the same model. It's not quite as fancy as that. One, it doesn't have the gold chain, and it certainly doesn't have my ancestor's picture on the face. Still, it's kind of interesting to look at it and think about what he had in mind at that time. <laughs> well, you know, I always love when we dig into the past, but I love archaeology stories. If you probably haven't guessed, that would have been my profession if genealogy hadn't grabbed me. In St. Petersburg, Florida, not very far away, is the remains of a Spanish fort called Fort Mos. Now, Fort Mos was a Spanish fort where enslaved individuals from the Carolinas would escape. Well, there's an archaeology dig. Now, it's not just on the ground. It's in about four feet of water mm. where archaeologists are looking for artifacts, pottery fragments, etc. Wow. And, and you know, it sounds like a very important place, too. And this was uh, in operation in the 1700s, so long before emancipation, those escaped slaves made their way south. Very, very true. Speaking of pottery shards, if you're in Iraq and as a tourist, don't pick any up. As you may have seen in the news, a British tourist who picked up pottery shards in an archaeological site in Iraq is now facing 15 years in prison. Ooh, that's a pretty heavy price to pay for picking up a souvenir. Well, on a positive note, we have the summer ahead of us and probably lots more stories. So, And if you hear any good ones, let us know. I'll talk to you on the back end for Ask Us Anything. All right, David, thank you so much. And coming up next, I'm going to talk to Krista Cowan from Ancestry.com. Speaking of enslaved individuals, Hawkins Wilson was one of those, and he sent letters to the Freedmen's Bureau after emancipation trying to get reconnected to his family. This has turned into a movie that you're going to want to hear about. It's coming up next in three minutes when we return on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Have you hit a brick wall in your family tree? Are you unsure how to use your DNA test results to resolve a research question? Do you want to travel where your ancestors walked and need to find details before you go? Need help joining a lineage society? Whatever your genealogy research question, the answer is Legacy Tree Genealogist. Legacy Tree Genealogist has been helping clients all over the globe discover their story since 2004. Legacy Tree has carefully selected and trained professionals who specialize in hundreds of countries and languages, as well as probate research and DNA analysis. And when you need experts on the ground in the countries where your ancestors came from, Legacy Tree Genealogists calls upon its global network of on-site researchers who know the local language and how to get their hands on the records you need. Request your free quote today at LegacyTree.com. That's LegacyTree.com. Genies, 10 years ago, in April of 2012, when the government released the 1940 census, it took Ancestry several months to complete and review an accurate index. Fast forward to today, using proprietary handwriting reading software, it took Ancestry only nine days to get the job done with the 1950 census. Now they held back results for a time for actual humans to review what the software had created. And after just a few weeks, it became obvious the software was near perfect and the computer generated index to 153,000 names has been released. What does this mean in your journey to research your family? It means you can search the entire database quickly and easily for your family members. Never has a U.S. Census Index been created as quickly as this. Go to Ancestry.com today. Click on the 1950 Census on the homepage and see what you can discover. Hey Genies, it's Fisher here, and my shiny new ExtremeGenes.com website has been described as having that new car smell. 
I love hearing that. Having been with you for over eight years now, it felt like time to help out listeners and followers who need to know the basics of genealogical research, as well as how to understand your DNA test results and to be able to put them to work for you breaking down brick walls, identifying birth parents, locating new cousins who may have photos and information that can't be found anywhere else, and verifying your paper trails. Yes, DNA can do all that, and I can show you how. Check out the all-new ExtremeGenes.com website and download the free Genealogy Strategy Roadmap and the free DNA Starter Guide. Then, if you like what you see, you can take those next steps to sign up for the video courses that you can watch at your leisure. I'll take you through all the basics, step-by-step. Find out more now at ExtremeGenes.com. And welcome back to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And look who I've got once again to talk to you about what's going on over at Ancestry.com, our great sponsors. It's Krista Cowan. And Krista, we got a lot to cover this week, including a really incredible story that a movie's been made out of. We've got to talk about today. We do. We absolutely do. But before we dive into that, uh, we maybe want to cover a little bit about some of the new records at Ancestry, one of the new features at Ancestry, and then we can spend the rest of the time talking about this great new movie. Absolutely. Well, where do we begin then? (laughs) <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about content. I think last month I mentioned that Ancestry has been working on releasing a series of French birth, marriage, and death records. And that just continues. We've rolled out another 36 million records for the Indra France region, Calvados France, another 15 million records. So that cadence just continues. Same with our cadence of our English Church of England records for marriages and burials and births and baptisms. Several million of those rolling out at a cadence of a couple million a week, actually. So a couple that's kind of million exciting. a week. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Isn't that insane? Yeah, it is. <laughs> and then let's get out of England and France. This month, we just published a set of Norwegian emigration records. So immigration, of course, is people coming into a country, which almost all countries keep track of. Sure. But emigration is people leaving. And so for about 100 years, Norway kept track of who was leaving. So if you've got roots there, you might want to go check out that collection. Yeah. Who has left the country? And I do have roots there, so I'm going to be checking it out and really looking forward to that. I'm still amazed, though, when you think of Western Europe, you tend to think, oh, my gosh, we've got everything from there. But no, it just keeps coming in. And we're talking about really important records in really large numbers. And the same for England. Of course, England is a very, very old country, but you're still talking about a lot of records from just the last 225 years or so. Yeah, you'd think at some point we're going to run out of them, but uh, new (laughs) records come to light every day. (laughs) Absolutely. It's great stuff. All right. Can we talk about the movie now? Yeah, we can. (laughs) I mean, this is this incredible. It's uh, it's called A Dream Delivered, The Lost Letters of Hawkins Wilson. And you can actually see it. It's out right now. It's on uh, Ancestry.com slash Black History. It's also streaming on Paramount Plus. And what a story. Just give us the background on this, Krista. Yeah. So some of you may remember that last year, Ancestry released a huge collection of the Freedmen's Bureau records. Of course, the Freedmen's Bureau was set up at the end of the Civil War to help the newly freed 4 million formerly enslaved people kind of manage their transition into education and labor contracts and housing and medical care. And so Ancestry has these records online. And as we looked through them, there was a unique set of records we discovered within that Freedmen's Bureau collection. Some of those newly emancipated individuals were writing letters to the Freedmen's Bureau, asking them to locate and deliver letters to their family members that they had been separated from. And And that itself was just a crisis, trying to get families back together and find where people had gone who had been sold off to other plantations. But this one treasure trove of letters from one individual has created an amazing thing 150 years later. Yeah. Yeah. Hawkins Wilson uh, was sold away from his family as a young boy 
25 years later as a, a grown man who's now newly emancipated, um, his uh, slave owner had taken him from North Carolina and Virginia, where he had been born and raised, out to Texas. And so he's writing this plea uh, to find his mother and his sisters, his cousins, like anybody that he could remember from 25 years earlier as a young boy um, and asking to have this letter delivered to them so that they know where he is and how he is. And, and how did that request go? Unfortunately, the letter was never delivered. Mm. Um, and so Ancestry uh, set out on this journey to discover uh, if we could reunite the descendants of Hawkins Wilson with the descendants of his family members that were left behind back east. Absolutely. And this has turned into this incredible real life film. And I'm, I'm going to be really fascinated to see the reaction of the people who obviously never knew they were related, didn't know of any connection, and are all going to be tied together, not only by this man, but by his letter and what his dream was. And even though he never really achieved his dream from what we know of getting back together with his parents and his siblings and all this, look at this. The descendants have gotten back together. Yeah, it's such a powerful thing. And, and we've seen these kinds of uh, reunion stories before to differing degrees, but this is just a whole new layer to that, um, that idea that families that were forcibly separated and that sought to find one another and weren't successful, and that now we've got these records on ancestry that can help us reconnect and reunite the descendants of those. I think it's just such a powerful experience. And we're not just reuniting them with each other, but with this shared history that they have as well. Right. And that's really huge. And Dr. Henry Lewis Gates, our good friend, is involved in this project. Yeah. A lot of people may know Skip from his television show, Finding Your Roots on PBS. Um, he's done uh, a lot of work with Ancestry over the years. He is such a powerful voice in the Black community for Black history. And he's also been studying family history for 60, more than 60 years of his own life. And he recognizes the challenges. And so throughout the video, he provides context and uh, understanding for Black Americans just to help them understand that it is completely possible to explore your family history. And there's never been a more important time to discover the truths of that history. And I think that, you know, he, he has this thing that he says, he says, the more we uncover our history as a society, the more we recognize our shared humanity. And yes. I absolutely believe that that's true. Absolutely. And you've also got Anthony Anderson from Blackish involved in this. You got some big names. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, it's always interesting when you start telling stories in a really meaningful way, the people that it attracts um, that want to lend their voice. And so, yes, um, Anthony is uh, involved in the film. He did some of the voiceovers for some of uh, the Hawkins letter that's read through the film. And he's also been doing some interviews for us in the time leading up to the premiere of the movie, just in time for Juneteenth. And I'm also excited about the idea that Nika Sewell Smith is involved in this. She's so big in our space, in the research side of it, and she's all a part of it. Tell us her role in this flick. Yeah, Nika is fantastic. Besides being a brilliant genealogist and researcher, very dynamic on-camera presence, she also happens to be my cousin. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a story that in itself. <laughs> it is. We made that discovery through DNA testing, ancestry DNA testing. So that's kind of fun. So she and I have been friends for years, and she is absolutely it just She's the guide in this movie. So she guides Hawkins relatives on this journey of discovery as they explore Wilson's life and his legacy, as they uh, go through the records and try to understand what the records are telling them. And then ultimately, as they reunite with their cousins. I can only imagine the reaction of some of these descendants as they make these connections. It must just be incredibly touching. Yeah. You know, there's always tears from the individuals when they're having the reunion, but you know that it's something special when, you know, the cameraman and the crew are all weeping as well <laughs> as they witness this reunion take place 
you have to orchestrate it a little bit for film, for camera, but these are really real emotions and real experiences as these very real people make these connections. Absolutely. And so now it's out. Everybody gets to see it. Once again, it is uh, streaming on Paramount Plus. It's on Ancestry.com slash Black History. It is the same film in both places. It's not like a short version on one and the full version on the other. But uh, I mean, just the whole journey, first of all, of discovery is what blows my mind that, you know, people can go out and take this collection of letters and then pull forward to find these people completely unsuspecting. Right. I mean, this is like the phone calls anybody makes to unsuspecting cousins and then shares with them some information that might rock their world, that'll change their lives. And certainly in this case, that is exactly what happens once again. You know, these things never get old, even though the formula is always the same. It doesn't matter your culture, your background, whatever it is. People want to know where they came from. And that's such an important part of knowing who you are is knowing that background. Yeah, absolutely. And there's so much resilience and hope that is showcased in a story like this. And when you start to think, I have some of those own stories in my own history, and I can make those discoveries and and then understand my past to such a degree that it uh, impacts my future as well. Sure. Do you see Ancestry doing more and more of this type of, uh, I would call it entertainment, but it's really a lot of infotainment as well, because it provides a lot of inspiration and information about how you can track your ancestors, especially in the African-American community that's been held back in that research for so long. It's just getting better and better. I hate the word easy because it's not. It's never easy, but it's less hard right now than it's ever been. Yeah, I mean, I I think I've mentioned this before on your show, but Ancestry has 30 billion records online. We release an average of 3 million new records a day. And while today we happen to talk about, you know, the English records and the French records, there's also, you know, the 1950 census, which 154 million Americans, a large percentage of which are Black Americans. um, That is the, the entry point for many people to discover their parents or their grandparents and start this family history journey. So it is doable and more records every day are making that more accessible for more people. That's great stuff. Well, thanks so much for your time again, Krista. We will talk to you again next month, find out about the new databases and whatever incredible project that you're engaged in. And we will see you then. Sounds good. Thanks so much. And the amazing stories continue next when I introduce you to the world's first floral genealogist. What does that mean? You'll find out in five minutes on Extreme Genes. Back on the job at Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show, and ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here, and I'm so excited to talk to my next guest. I read about her online. She is a floral genealogist. What is that? Of course, she's a lot more than that, but uh, let's meet Barbara Holloway Smith. She is a horticulturalist at Clemson Extension in South Carolina. Barbara, welcome to Extreme Genes. It's great to have you. Thank you, Scott. It's a delight to be here. I hope y'all can understand my southern accent. (laughs) We love it. Hey, tell me, I've never heard of a floral genealogist before. Fill us in on exactly what you do. Well, I am absolutely, totally passionate about plants, have been since basically birth. My families on both sides of my family tree were extreme gardeners and farmers, as true of early South Carolina. I have plants that belong to my grandmothers, my parents, my great-grandmothers, my (laughs) great-great-grandmothers, and it just makes me smile when I see these blooming in my yard to know that for me collecting them from their gardens or the ruins of their gardens, that they saw the same things blooming that I did. So this is what you did. You went out and you actually found plants that your second great-grandmother grew at some place in time. How did you go about this? Obviously, it involves some research. Well, I knew where the home places were. Okay. I always laugh. My family gene pool has been, you know, stagnating in South Carolina since pre-Revolutionary War. 
So I knew where the old home places were, and I'm fascinated with history. I grew up teething on genealogy because that research goes back for four generations with different family members doing extensive genealogy. And of course, I've taken it even farther because of access online now. So you've had genealogists in your family for four generations? Four generations, yes. Wow. So did all their information get passed down to you along the way or at least find its way back to you? Part of it did. Uh, I have documents that date pre-revolution, original documents. Wow. Uh, Civil War letters between great-great-grandparents. I have a first cousin who inherited a lot of information also and then several other more distant cousins. And we have had weekends where we've all gotten together and scanned and shared information. So I have a pretty complete list. Yeah, that's great. So you took this, you've obviously developed your tree, you know who your people are, you've got your documentation. So when did this idea come along that you wanted to collect the plants of your ancestors? Oh, that goes back to my teenage years. Really? Back in the 60s and 70s, right. Well, definitely in the 70s. Well, I'm telling you how old I am now. (laughs) And like I said, I have always been fascinated with plants. I'm fascinated with plant material that sometimes I cannot identify. Mm -hmm. Uh, There is one Budlia now on the market butterfly bush called Miss Vicey. And I found a remnant of that plant at my great-grandmother's garden in Newberry County. Her name was Vicey Jennings Holloway. Everybody, including her husband, called her Miss Vicey. And she had a very extensive garden. And, of course, by the time I saw the garden or whatever, it was covered in kudzu and wisteria and in ruins. Ooh. And I found this very interesting plant. It was in the winter. The plant had lost its leaves because it was deciduous. It had very interesting striped bark on it. So I dug it up, potted it up to see what it was. And then the next spring, when it leafed out and started blooming in the summer, I knew I had something different. Wow. So I took it to a good friend of mine, Rick Berry, who had Goodness Grows Nursery over in Georgia. I shared one with him because I had propagated from it. And I told him, I don't know what this is. They sent it to the Arnold Arboretum to be identified. They said it was a new cultivar of Budley Lindleyana that they had not seen. Wow. (laughs) And did he want to name it after me? And I said, (laughs) no. I said, it was my great-grandmother's and she may haunt me. So it has to be Miss Vicey. Oh, that's funny. That's amazing. So you actually discovered a new plant type as a result of all this. Right. A new cultivar. (laughs) Right. Of course, I let Rick market it, so they introduced it to the horticulture trade, so it's out there. Isn't that amazing? So you've got this uh, amazing garden now. Do you have rows of plants based on the generations of your ancestors that the plants came from? No, they're all mixed in because with plant material, you've got to grow it where the plants will be happy. Okay. You know, some prefer morning sun, afternoon shade, some full sun, some more water than others. My landscaped area covers close to about an acre and a half, two acres. That's amazing. And we live on a farm, which I always laugh, compared to farms out west, we're probably the size of somebody's backyard. (laughs) So I have a sweetheart rose that came from my paternal grandparents. The story is it's actually a Cecily Bruner, and when it was blooming, The story in the family is that my grandfather would pick off a bud and put it in his lapel before he left for work every day and say, this is for my sweetheart, meaning his wife, Sally. Oh, wow. So the stories that go along with these plants. And I have big American boxwoods that are huge, eight or nine feet tall, that actually came from cuttings of my great-great-grandparents' home in Blackville, South Carolina. So sometimes it wasn't that you found a plant that they planted. It was just something that was on their property. That counts, right? Well, sure it does. Yeah. Now, it was one that they planted. My mother had gotten cuttings from these plants Ah, and rooted them. She loved to root boxwoods, and so she rooted them. And so that makes it even more special. Sure. Because she got the cuttings from her great-grandparents. Right. 
I have a lot of daffodil bulbs and narcissus bulbs that came from different ancestors' gardens that I dug up and transplanted. Wow. Did you ever find any documents where they actually reference planting any of these particular plants? There is one great-grandmother. Her name was Mary Perry Millhouse, and not specifically referencing, but I have a cousin had loaned me the diary he had in her possession that she wrote in the 1870s. And I kept it for about six months. Took me about that long to transcribe it because you had to have a magnifying glass oh, yeah. to go word by word. <laughs> and in it, she talks constantly about what's blooming, what's growing in the yard, what flowers that she's picked to put in the house. She was very interested in nature. Yeah. She loved animals. She had a brother that lived in Texas, so he sent her prairie dogs and horny toads, and she had a pet <laughs> alligator. And I mean, it was just. Oh, my gosh. They said, right. They said she had a little Carolina anole, which is a little gecko type that lives in South Carolina. And she had a little chain and a jewel collar made for it. And so she would pin the chain to her dress and the no would crawl all over her Oh, that's shoulders. funny. So have you ever taken pictures of the plants to associate with the ancestors and their stories that you might be able to pass these along down the line? Oh, yes, that's documented. I'm very detailed. I have a folder, and that's one of my plans to do, to have a photo of the ancestor, if I have that, along with the photo of the plant that came from them and a description of where the house was located and if I dug the plant up or I took cuttings Perfect. or whatever. What so. a great idea. I think there are going to be a lot of people hearing this who are going to say, I'm going to go out and do that. I mean, you are unique in that you know know where a lot of these people were from and they all planted and you were in their area so that helps out a lot but I think a lot of people are going to have some fun with this she may be the world's first floral genealogist she's Bar <laughs> Barbara Holloway Smith from South Carolina Barbara thanks for coming on and sharing your story I love it I think it's a lot of fun Oh, you are so welcome, Scott, and this has been a delight. Just love sharing my story with people. <laughs> Thanks so much. Coming up next, David Allen Lambert as we go through your questions once again with Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Hey, Genies. Ancestry now has an exclusive partnership with PhotoMind, the leader in photo scanning and archiving. What does this mean to you? Well, imagine inheriting an old photo album and you want to digitize all the images. Up until now, you'd have to remove the pictures, place them in a scanner, crop them, and perhaps use Photoshop to improve them. Now, by using these amazing PhotoMind tools from Ancestry, you can use your phone to take a picture of an entire page from your album. The tools will automatically separate and crop each picture, improve focus, and restore color or colorize your images. Then you can assign which picture goes to which person on your tree. If you've been waiting years to get around to the tedious project of scanning your old albums, it's been worth the wait. No more pulling your photo albums apart and trying to reinsert the pictures back in proper order. No more tearing of your old photos while removing them from those so-called magnetic albums of the 1970s. Sign in to Ancestry through their mobile app to try it out. Hey, Genies. As we've dug into our family history explorations over the past year, our community at Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies has taken off. This is where you can meet like-minded genealogists who can help you break through those brick walls and find a whole city behind it occupied by ancestors whose names you don't even know yet. This is where you can learn from your fellow Genies and ask questions because many in our community have already been into some of the records you're looking for. Genealogy and Breakthrough Strategies is free. What a great place for brainstorming and getting to know other people who totally get your passion for family history research. If you're looking to take the next step in sharpening your skills, here's a great chance to learn from others and give back in areas you've already become expert in. So join us. That page again is Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. It's a long name, but we cover a lot of territory. Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. Have you hit a brick wall in your family tree? Are you unsure how to use your DNA test results to resolve a research question? Do you want to travel where your ancestors walked and need to find details before you go? 
Need help joining a lineage society? Whatever your genealogy research question, the answer is Legacy Tree Genealogist. Legacy Tree Genealogist has been helping clients all over the globe discover their story since 2004. Legacy Tree has carefully selected and trained professionals who specialize in hundreds of countries and languages, as well as probate research and DNA analysis. And when you need experts on the ground in the countries where your ancestors came from, Legacy Tree Genealogists calls upon its global network of on-site researchers who know the local language and how to get their hands on the records you need. Request your free quote today at LegacyTree.com. That's LegacyTree.com. All right, welcome back to the show. It is Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here. David Allen Lambert is back from the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. Dave, first question today. Hello, guys. A cousin recently gave me some documents all over a century old that have been folded many times. I'm afraid to fully open them and certainly can't frame them or put them into a binder. I'd like to enjoy them more, but don't know what to do with them. Thoughts, please. Mary Lou in Cincinnati. Ooh, well, that's definitely a conservator's <laughs> nightmare sometimes, especially if it's acidic paper, wood pulp paper, latter 19th, early 20th century. It's like finding those folded up newspaper clippings in the family Bibles that your great grandmother saved. You, know, like you open them up and now instead of one clipping, you have 10. It's really the age of the paper. My personal estimation is that you look at something that may be from the 1700s or the early 1800s, it's going to be on rag stock paper. Right. And if it's really early, it could be on parchment, which does have tendency to crack only if it's under bad conditions but i've seen parchment that's hundreds upon hundreds over a thousand years old that's able to be preserved and conserved because sometimes it rolls up tight folding though offers another problem if it's folded damaged like wet then you have the bleed of the ink across to the back of the page There may be an adhesive, like a wax seal that may have caused some damage to it too, or just iron ball ink itself, which is truly acidic and will eat through paper. Oh boy! Now, ragstock is good, but I would use caution. I would also see if you can find, if there is a person in a genealogical group that you're nearby or maybe even a university that does conservation. Now, I can tell you up north here in the Northeast Document Conservation Center in Massachusetts, people will send things that you just can't even open because they're folded so tight or right. packed together in a box. So you may have some hefty bills to get it conserved but what a treasure that lies in that folded letter yeah the hardest thing about those too dave is you can't really scan them either you know you might be able to hold it open enough to photograph it in in various parts and try to use photoshop to put it together digitally but it is a real problem i have a lot of uh, old newspapers and i have a couple of marriage certificates from the 1870s that are really badly folded. I haven't tried with the marriage certificates, but with the newspapers, I've taken it to a framer's place where they had a technique for actually relaxing the paper. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result of that, they were able to mount it on a piece of foam board. And so I could frame it. I had a poster, for instance, from the 1980s that had gotten some wrinkles in it from too much humidity in the air, and they were able to relax that and take it right out. Now, I don't know if that technique is available where you can do that with a paper and not attach it to something else. I don't know if they can just relax the paper Mm -hmm. and hand it back to you or how they use that. And I actually tried to contact the uh, the folks who have used that in anticipation of this question today. And they're out of business, so I can't do anything with that to find out anything further. But I would suggest that if one framing shop had that type of device, there will be many others possibly in your area too to help you get those things relaxed, whether it's an old newspaper, an old document, whatever it may be. But David's advice is excellent. Go out and get a conservator's advice because we don't know what kind of paper you're dealing with. We don't know about the acidity question. There are just so many things to deal with when you've got a problem like that. 
So good luck with that. And hopefully you can find some way other than piling a bunch of books on it and watching the whole thing crack to uh, to make sure it works out. All right. We got another listener question coming up when we return in three minutes with Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Back at it on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher and David here. And our next question on Ask Us Anything, Dave, is from Robbie in Flint, Michigan. And uh, Robbie asks, guys, of all the things you guys have preserved, what are the most unusual things you've collected? That is Ooh. interesting. I-, I got a fern that was stuck in some Bible pages once that came from Sweden. It had a little note that it was attached to, and it mm-hmm. had a date on it from the 1850s. And to be honest with you, Dave, I really don't know what to do with it other than to put it in some kind of binder with acid-free stuff to keep it there. But it just falls apart, you know? You know, and the same thing is true with anything. We just want to make sure that we're carrying it to the next generation so they can can. figure out what to do with it, maybe even a little bit better. (laughs) I have an envelope that has the locks of hair from my 18-month-old uncle who would later go on to fight at the beaches of Normandy. Oh. So he had curly blonde hair. I knew him as bold as a cue ball. But (laughs) these locks are, you know, nearly 96 years of age, and they're still as bright as they would have been cut and put in the envelope back then. Hair jewelry, mourning rings, brooches. There are people that specialize in collecting mourning jewelry, and it's not always from the recently deceased. Sometimes it's from family members. But, I mean, that's probably, for me, the oddest thing. Now, personally, I don't have any post-mortem photography. So, Back in the 19th century, if you lost a loved one or a child, you may not have a photograph. And that was the last chance to get it. And a lot of undertakers would partner with photographers. Funerals were done at home, so sometimes a person is, like, propped up next to relatives. And I've seen some, and I'm like, is that person alive or dead? So that would be the odd thing, I think, if I found that in my family photographs. I mean, if it was the only picture I'd have of a third great grandfather, uh, I, I may mean, not frame <laughs> it and put it out for general display, right. um, but I would be delighted to have it because it was a picture of him, maybe the only one. Hmm. You know, and- I've got another one. I've got a yep. pig. It's a ceramic pig from 1902. When my wife's grandfather turned four years old, his cousin presented him with this pig. So the pig was passed along to my wife's brother, who's had it for these many, many, many years. And we told him we didn't want it, but he didn't care. He packaged it up and sent it to us. So now we have it, and we don't know really what to do with it. It's an ugly thing. It has a chip out of it. It's 120 years old. And and so what do you do with that? I don't know. Uh, You hope that you have a loving descendant that will embrace that pig like it was their very own. (laughs) I mean, the other thing with any artifacts that you save for future generations, a little note, like a note in a teacup or a teapot, will prevent these things from being discarded and or sold on eBay. So people like Fisher and I will buy them. (laughs) I also have a coffee pot that was given to my great grandparents in 1884 I mean, it's Mm -hmm. just falling apart, and I found it in my mother's effects and thought, what is this? And Mm -hmm. then I found some notes that she had once left about heirlooms, and she described it well, literally to a T. Uh, so I was really, <laughs> oh. yeah, I was really quite surprised. But pleased to know that this was from 1884 in Sweden. So who knew? So thanks for the question, Robbie. And hopefully you can find some better stuff than these items as you mm-hmm. put your uh, family ancestral heirloom collection together. But it's fun to see what you can find, even the strange stuff. Dave, thanks so much again, and we'll talk to you again next week, buddy. Until then, my friend. All right. And that's our show for this week. Thanks once again to Krista Cowan from Ancestry, filling us in on this amazing new movie, A Dream Delivered, The Lost Letters of Hawkins Wilson. You're going to want to see it on Ancestry.com slash Black History. 
Also, Barbara Holloway Smith, the floral genealogist, talking about collecting the plants and trees planted by her ancestors. If you missed any of the show, of course, catch the podcast on Apple Media, iHeartRadio, ExtremeGenes.com, Spotify, TuneIn Radio. We are all over the place. Talk to you next week. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. Thank you.